Good evening and welcome to the Force Freedom Podcast on the Seeds of Liberty Network. You can find all of our content on theseedsofliberty.com or on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm Donnie. This is Lloyd. Say hello, Lloyd. Hello, Lloyd. Smart ass. So, uh, tonight we're doing something just a bit different. For all of the episodes up till now, it's kind of a little bit about me and Lloyd and how did we get here and just the basic fundamentals of uh, somebody who might be listening to us. So now we're going the other way. We're going full libertarian slash anarchist nerd um, into the depths. Yeah, just for a change of pace, but to give you a good idea of what an argument looks like on the far side of this. Um, You know, all of the, hey, this is, you know, don't use fallacies and and, uh, clean up your arguments so that they're logically sound and, and validated and uh, this is kind of the far side where actually you make an argument that doesn't really involve uh, those fallacies. You don't assume that some, just because something is the law is correct. So, I, I mean, imagine making an argument about the state where you never reference it as as a legitimate entity. And um, just to give you the other side, that that's kind of what I was thinking about when I tossed this over to Lloyd. I don't know what you thought about it, Lloyd, because it was all done over text and we did it kind of quick. <laughs> well, well, you know, you kept telling me, save it for the audio. <laughs> and that's yeah. entirely valid. <laughs> uh, but oh, yeah, I, I, mean, I didn't mean I didn't mean what you were thinking about. I meant just the overall premise. Yeah. Um, well, the whole the, the entire argument started off with a shaky foundation to begin with. And no, I meant that the idea of the show. That's. Oh, oh, I'm no, sorry. Nothing about them yet. Nothing I'm, about I'm them still, yet. I'm I really, I'm saving that. Yeah, that's my, that's my <laughs> fortune cookie for the day. Is what did, what did Lloyd think when he heard this? Yeah, I'm, I'm, my, I'm so focused in on that right now. My brain is like wired for uh, rhetorical analysis. <laughs> okay, so the whole point of this is, um, you got some homework right off the bat. You don't even. You, you, this little opener here um, is not going to apply to you for 37 minutes. And uh, on YouTube, you go to Tom Woods 470. That's his. Uh, that's the Tom Woods show number 470. And there is a debate on there between Robert Murphy and Walter Block. And if you're kind of new to the whole deal, you won't know who these people are. Um, boy, did I know who these people are? They are very, very intelligent people. Uh, both PhDs, both are teaching. Uh, once uh, Block teaches at Loyola, Murphy teaches at Texas A and M, um, and there are some na- there's some names dropped in there for you all to, uh, if you haven't, to start exposing yourself to some of their material because these guys are super solid, and and the debate really is kind of prefaced right at the beginning, and that is this is uh, a gentleman's game. That these guys agree on so much stuff that this is really just. I don't want to say a fringe argument, but it's really out there on the uh, the logical consistency, uh, rational, uh, strategic kind of thing as far as the libertarian methodology really goes. It's it, these, these there's no yelling, there's no screaming, and these guys would happily sit down and drink a beer with each other. So, unlike what you would see in a Republican or a Democrat debate, and the level of sophistry that they will bring into an argument, this is like completely the opposite, where two people who really kind of understand what they're talking about and are very similar views are just having a very non-sophist debate about particular points. And what Lloyd found and what I found were, were I don't know what they were the same or different. I mean, Like I said, it's my fortune cookie. So, go and listen. Tom Woods... 470 in your spree time and then the rest of this you could go ahead and continue later um, just to see where we came down on it and where two fucking clowns who spent some time in the military can uh, bounce their heads off of two PhDs and then you can all laugh at us later or maybe not and it should be noted yeah like like Donnie said this is kind of like a gentleman's game and uh, but I will say that I, you know, I was very impressed when I uh, read uh, Walter Block's defending the indefensible or undefendable 
I'm not sure how he phrased it. Uh, fantastic book. I recommend everybody read that after they have a basic uh, understanding of economics. That will shatter a lot of uh, illusions you might have and things that you have been taught, but maybe at such a young age you never examined the ideas that you were taught. And uh, likewise, uh, Robert Murphy has a has the Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, which is, <clears throat> well, let's just say it's it's good for beginners as well. Blocks is more uh, a bit more of an advanced work because uh, <laughs> you want those basics before you get, before you tackle his. Otherwise, he's going to be using a lot of terms that you're maybe not going to be familiar with, uh, economically speaking. But uh- yeah. And I would name drop uh, Chaos Theory, Bob Murphy's book, Chaos Theory. It's free. It's on YouTube. Um, it's pretty marvelous. And that's really the minarchist. That's the minarchist bread and butter. How could this happen? Uh, it answers questions. How could this happen without a state, right? And uh, some of the, it's like police and courts and uh, defense, uh, things that really get into that idea where, okay, I I understand what I'm talking about, I'm a constitutionalist, but we really have to have the state for just these very few things. Uh, Chaos theory is really about throwing throwing those arguments into the hot wash and and saying, do we really need them? Is it economically required? Is it pragmatically required? Is there some kind of principle there? And and kind of getting through that. And uh, chaos theory was probably... I was already kind of like, man, I don't, I don't really think we need to stay for anything. Chaos theory was my clincher of, yep, not even for defense, like not even that. That's that the end, the the end of the day. So, so yeah, okay. uh, shall we tackle this? Uh, yes. this uh, so, beefy little argument of theirs. So here's your here's your your opportune time. Uh, shut off the two knuckleheads from the military, and and go watch Tom Woods four seventy and get an idea of what uh, Murphy and Block's arguments were, and then ready to go. Uh, everything else from here is a spoiler. <laughs> All right, so, so Donnie, what's, what's your initial take on the arguments of the, uh, that Murphy poses regarding the, the getaway car driver, the robber, and the liquor store owner? Um, so I, I think the analogy was... Um, it doesn't work when you apply it to the state, and, and uh, in the same way that he he kind of, block kind of throws down an exe- a premise that if you if you steal from a thief you're not a thief, and I would say that that is not a universal statement. Um, if you if a thief steals a thousand dollars of you know worth of golf clubs or just a thousand dollars, and then you steal his car. Uh, you've gone well above and beyond the kind of uh, notion that uh, of, uh, of uh, restitution. So to, to universally say, if you steal from a thief, it's okay, I think Walter is way off on that one. And I think Bob accepted that just way too easily. And that kind of led to this bad analogy where a private liquor store owner gets robbed and the getaway driver tries to make some sort of Rothbardian defense in yeah his 20 percent cut right in his 20 percent cut oh well i you know i have a better driver than the guy that they were talking about having to do it so he would have just run people over for fun and i, I don't think it works primarily because when walter block is talking about stealing from the state there's one thing that you can say for the state that you can't say for anyone else and that is absolutely everything that it has is stolen yep. so it's a very narrow argument that could you steal from the government? He was making, you know, like, uh, you know, if they're a janitor and you're stealing mops, or if you're a janitor yeah. and you're and you're doing, you know, vandalizing the building at night or whatever. Um, okay, if you want to look at that as kind of the weakest insurgent that's ever walked the face <laughs> of the earth. Okay, fine. And in this one instance, I think the argument that Bach makes works because, literally, without any exaggeration. The state has nothing that it didn't take from somebody else, right? And and so and so, this is where, this is where I come. I always just come back to the the premise and I take a look at it at the very outset. And so, what Murphy starts off with is what's known as a weak analogy. 
the, the closer you get to what something is when you're ma- trying to make an analogy, the stronger your analogy is going to be. So this is a strong analogy. And the farther away, the weaker this is going to be. And the more difficult it will be to defend whatever actual argument you're making by use of that analogy. Um, you know, like you'll hear a lot of uh, both strong and weak analogies from Molyneux, for example, who's a, like the master of analogies. Uh, yeah. I can't, I just don't do them. Uh, so here's the here's the problem with this, and you've you've pointed out one thing, right? The the robber, uh, he, he not everything he has is stolen. Uh, so in, inherently, right there, there's a big step away from the state. Uh, right. In in a, and in addition, of course, because of this, you know, because of this weak analogy, then block. Accept, accepts and puts forward accepts that premise which he should have stopped right there and just said well instead of an analogy why don't we just talk about the real thing right because that would have been you know no analogy and instead you're actually discussing the subject and not mm-hmm. ini- and not initiating uh, you know flaws in the argument already right mm-hmm. so and <laughs> And then he then he takes it to the and you can see the ridiculousness of where this leads by when he invokes the janitor, right? And yes. you're just like, really? Oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you can't universalize this. You yes. can't universalize. Hey, it's okay to destroy property. Right. No. Uh, right. So, so it it just doesn't hold. And this is, you know, principally the problem where you get when you uh, when you try to take in ethics uh, from, uh, you know, ethical arguments from economists. Because this isn't their specialty. Right. So, the next part of that that I got to is, especially specifically the the example that he used, um, if you were to take money from the state, you already, it's inherently understood that this money, or, or whatever, was stolen. However, this liquor store owner was was as the analogy put a private individual not just a private individual but one that you know who it is it's impossible to break the mop up that you stole and somehow divvy that back up to the people it was stolen from to to return this whereas you know where this guy's funds came from so to say okay yes i took it back and then i used it myself that's I don't see that as any different as than than somebody else did your dirty work for you. You took somebody else's money and then you kept it. Right. Saying I stole from the robber, this is a virtue, uh, is really just kind of hiding your own theft behind a quasi, you know, theoretically Rothbardian ethic. When in reality, you could have taken that money, you could have given it back to the actual victim. Where unlike government theft. You don't exactly know who this goes back to. It, how, okay, it, do I just hand this to somebody at random? Do I just give this mop away to the next guy I see on the street? And, and then it comes into one of the things they say later: Are you later? Are you a net taxpayer, or are you a uh, one of the one of the finer points they tried to use to justify the argument? Anyway, was are you a net taxpayer, or are you a net tax receiver as to where you fit in the whole thing? And so, yeah, the the whole the whole problem becomes one of a contradiction, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it looks like on on its face, like the contradiction lies with those who are engaging in the actions, but it's not. The contradiction lies in the in the welfare state. Mm-hmm. So all of these all these thefts going on by this agent who is unavoidable, and you know it. With the exception of you know becoming as suicided, uh, you know a hermit, you know it, at immense economic dis- you know detriment to yourself, mm-hmm. and you know every other uh, sort of detriment. You know it's un- it's it's unavoidable. You have no capacity to avoid the state. You know absent you know your destruction from society basically. Right. So you're kind of in you're you're already a little bit outside the realm of ethics, you know, of being able to engage in universal uh, principles here. Yes. So, you know, you, you have to have the capacity for avoidance in order to be held uh, to that moral standard. Otherwise, I mean, you're, everyone's, a, everyone's a thief. Everyone's, you know, and these, right. just, uh, these just don't hold. 
because you know the guy who accepts welfare for example I, yeah you know maybe he works at some point in his life and it's taken from him he didn't engage in that contract you know voluntarily so it's, it's automatically he's been you know stolen from so it's entirely just for him to take and he has no capacity to know the actual extent to which he has been affected because he has no capacity for avoidance right so and he, I, I think so yeah I think when that, you like look at the like okay you can look at your like social security thing you get the annual statement that says how much you've put in right okay well that's one thing what about all the uh, unseen costs now the economists here they should know this you know all these unseen costs of the state that you pay into by virtue of the fact that you know you didn't save a lot of money because it's been privatized etc right. uh, all these other factors uh, just just go to show that the robber and the state are not quite the same and for certain right. the driver and you know the moral agent in the argument here is not uh, the same and i think that's where it slips into the the I mean, for lack of a better way to put it, the slave paradigm. If you're losing anything between a percent, you know, a, a fraction of a percent or a hundred percent, to a certain extent, you are a slave to that percentage by which your productivity is being siphoned off. Right. So, and can you make this highly principled stance where you you refuse to use currency, you you refuse to use roads? Um, yes. You can do that, but in reality, uh, at a certain point, you either have to, as as it, you know, Block said, you have to commit suicide, or you have to run off into the into the woods and become a hermit. So the reality of the situation is, you are a slave, and the level to which you fight back, you you essentially get to decide whether you're going to be a house slave or a field slave, and that's really the only choice that you were given. It doesn't make any of this legitimate. It doesn't make any of this. Uh, okay, it just means that you can't really affect the whole things. So... Right, so, like... The, and, okay. and the whole point is this, this This analogy is to describe somebody working for the state. Right, yeah, they're, they're trying to this defend is, their own positions in academia. Right. This is the principled argument behind working for the state, essentially. Right, and, and, and as, as such, you know, they're... Uh, <laughs> They are, you know, they're 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 emotionally invested in this, and this is and this is something you can see by their. I mean, these are two very very astute gentlemen, but you yes. can see that there's an emotional conflict in there that's, it, you know, causing some haywiring in their uh, in their ability to make rational arguments. Because well, uh, I mean, Block right off the right off the top conflates theft and the receiving of stolen goods, because the getaway driver, he's not stealing. He, or well, robbing, which is never really defined, right? Uh, in either case, he's not actually, you know, taking stuff. He's just kind of a receiver of stolen goods. He gets the 20%. Right now, in a court of law, I mean, you're still an accessory to, so you're morally you're responsible for. But that conflates the agency of actually doing the act, right? Right. So, right. you know, I mean, and, and that may, there's no distinction there between the driver and the person who, when they turn 67 or whatever, gets Social Security. You're still not a thief. Right. Right. And that's... And, and, and there are and multiple arguments, I'm sure, if you did your homework and you listened to it, you, you've heard where taking your, your money back from the state in a way the state approves of, there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. No, you know, it, it was taken... It was... Well, I mean, not even legal. It, it, remember, legal isn't an argument in this. It's, yep. We're not using the state standard ethics to do it. <laughs> it's even then you can rationally, logically, empirically justify why this is okay for you to do. Sure. But but I think that's where the kind of the principled arguments end, and that's where the strategic arguments begin as to what is overall good for liberty. And that was the part that I really thought was a lot more interesting than trying to go with the principle because I think the absolute principle is correct and that is you can't use currency, you can't use roads and if and you know if you're going to live in America, right? Otherwise, you just have to go find a place way out in the middle of nowhere where you can squat and nobody's going to bother you and that's the end of it. Right. 
and and yeah, and I mean that demonstrates the fact that you are already outside of the realm of ethics once you're in this uh, state where you can pun unintended, uh, where you have no capacity for avoidance. You know, hey, you're now you're no longer in the realm of principle. You're in the realm of pragmatism. Or welcome, or you, to, welcome to consequentialism. Right, or the realm of. Uh, you'd have to be making some seriously detrimental, irrational decisions to yeah. get to gain avoidance. Right. So, I mean, to the to the point of where you're more likely to end up like the Unabomber than you are anything else, just living in a hut out in the middle of of godforsaken nowhere. And even then, he was still using the mail. Yep. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You have to literally annihilate yourself. If yes. not actually dead, then you have no. You're out of society. So go for let's let's go with the Rothbardian as they as they laid out the Rothbardian the strategic argument and and go because I'm really curious I want to hear yours before I hear anybody else's right so um you know you can kind of look at look at this from a consequentialist standpoint because which you kind of have to because you can't apply universal moral principles once you're outside the realm of ethics I mean it all becomes consequentialism at that point it's like uh it's like the trolley car. Uh, thought experiment that uh, oh god was that Kant I can't remember anyway it's like the trolley car thought experiment in philosophy so you know you have this choice of uh, you're controlling this trolley car and you know you're on the track and you're and you and suddenly you know uh, you're you're the brakes fail and immediately on the on the track ahead of you are two people and this trolley's going to kill them and but you can switch the track. You can't stop it, but you can switch the track and to the other track and there's only one guy on that track. Do you kill the two people or the one? So you're already outside the realm of ethics. You know, you're not an agent anymore until you make that choice. Right? And then you get the other half of that uh of that thought experiment where you have you <laughs> It's kind of ridiculous, but uh, you're like in the sky on like a trolley car thing overlooking this, and you know that if you kick this fat guy that's in the trolley that's in your cab out, his impact will be such that he will he will die, but he'll he'll stop the trolley car, etc. Anyway, it comes down to you're outside the realm of ethics already, and now you're dealing with consequentialism, and so you know you're but don't conflate the 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 ch- the choice. Your agency choosing of that uh, two people to die versus the one, or vice versa, versus you actually kicking a person out of the, your out of your vehicle or whatever it is in the sky and killing him—that is murder, right? Yes. Uh, so you get this. Uh, you get this. You get this problem right there from the outset, and it it just becomes unresolvable if you want to stay in the realm of ethics. So it comes down to consequentialism, at which point you get to make your own determination. So, and and this is how I approach it. Do I want the state to end faster or slower? Because, I mean, we know it's ending eventually. I mean, it just has to, economically. And maybe another state will take its place. But do you want to... I mean, you're already not in the realm of ethics. So do you want it to, to... get what you can from it or do you want to try to avoid it and like starve it as much as you can because you know really either's fine it's consequential so what's it what's it going to be do you want do you want the the softer landing or do you want to you know uh or do you want to dive head first into the ground uh, you know high speed dirt you know skydive wise uh, what's it going to be the the fast band-aid or the slow band-aid that's really all it comes down to, at least for me. Uh, okay, so now pick apart their arguments. Well, for I don't, they're not even making a good argument in the, in this realm. Uh, no, for for the strategic one, I, it was oh, much better than the principled one. Yeah, the um, for um, so far as uh, if if you want to end the state faster, the one argument goes, the the way to do it is to take as much of what it offers. And and just accept all of those things, man. Uh, you know, if you qualify, get your TANF, get your SNAP, get get everything, man. Get that welfare housing if if you're willing to put up with that kind of conditions. Uh, take it all, you know, because you will bleed it dry. And 
they're offering it, and it's stolen anyway. It, it's a given. It's stolen. And you can't even calculate the amount from which, uh, of which you've been stolen from. So just take it, right? And that's kind of a, that's kind of a, I think it was Block's argument regarding, you know, being that ridiculous janitor, right? Everything's fine, just, you know, because all, all that the state has is stolen. Okay, so that, that's, that's one argument. And that really comes down to, you know, you want it to end faster. And then there's the, uh, the other end of the argument, which is, you know, we want this to come down slowly so people have time to prepare, etc. You know, however you want to, you know, rationalize that. In which case, you'd want to avoid as much as possible the state. Now, you can't really do the absolute unless you're willing to self-destruct. You know, you want to be that martyr that nobody's even going to hear or see? Go ahead. Uh, you will affect no change. Um, but, you know, you you can try the sound... And it's a sound argument. No, it's just a matter of choice at this point. It's consequentialism. You can try to avoid, you know, Social Security. Engage in agorism, potentially. That's one kind of revolutionary per, part of this, where you can... Uh, you know, avoid economic activity that enables the state to take your money, e- even though you're st- I mean, you're still going to have to use their currency to some extent, right? So these are the two these are the two different approaches you can kind of do. So so Block was making a similar argument to that. Um, you know, it wasn't really saying a fast or slow method, but he was basically saying if you're working within the Rothbardian ethic you can take a job working for the government and and your salary in and of itself is um is giving the state less resources and you're using your resources for what you do and you're going there and you're you're eating up the resources of the state so not necessarily in a fast or slow method as you were describing just in the overall, you're siphoning uh, resources from the state. This is the kind of activity that Rothbard would approve of anyway. You know, it's, it's in that Rothbardian ethic of this service would, uh, like if you're working for roads, roads are going to exist in a stateless society. Uh, mail is going to exist in a stateless society. Uh, you know, administrative tasks, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, you know, HR. The, all of these things exist in, a, in a statelessness. So, sure, you could go ahead and do this. And uh, it, it's really not outside of the libertarian scope, so that's okay. And uh, Bob's argument was that uh, by demonstrated preference, you're assisting the state because you're showing up, you're doing things that the state approves of, you're doing, uh, you're you're generating value based on their demonstrated preference of keeping you and promoting you uh, in that system, right. And, and that's and that's a, that actually kind of coincides with uh, uh, Randian objectivist ethics, wherein the recipient of uh, public funds is morally justified only so long as he regards it as a restitution, and imposes. This is the intent factor of ethics, all forms of you know this kind of welfare statism and stuff. Uh, but those who advocate for such have no right to them. Those right. who oppose those things do have. The, have the uh, have the right to these things, right? And, and th- this highlights the moral contradiction of of the of the state, and not the victims, right? And and I think this is where I think both of their arguments failed, and I think both of their arguments failed because they they both took the the stances and then went completely 180 degrees with them, so. And the example I'm going to use is the Fed. Okay, so Bloch's argument is you're a libertarian, you're on the inside, uh, you're not really doing anything to advance the state, and you're 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 taking money from it. And and Bob's argument is saying, okay, but by demonstrated preference, you're you're there and you're and you're taking these positions and you're getting promoted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to go right outside. I, I'm going to say that even outside of the Rothbardian ethic you can still have this both ways only opposites of what they were arguing and because it's the fed 
it doesn't it doesn't go the Rothbardian way at all. Uh, Rothbard would say you can't work for the Fed because the Fed wouldn't exist in a in a free society. So here's where um, Bob's argument actually makes sense, and that is the case of Paul Volcker. And if you don't know who Paul Volcker is, he was uh, the, the chairman of the Fed during the, the very early Reagan years, or maybe just the first year. And Paul Volcker was running the Fed in a very um, I don't want to I don't, don't necessarily want to say libertarian, but uh, responsible way. The way the way a, a libertarian would adjust an interest rate for his own bank. You know what I mean? Now, I understand that Volcker's doing it for the entire economy, but he was letting money be the, the natural cost of money that it should have been. And he wasn't uh, printing a bunch of money and giving favorable, favorable interest rates to avoid paying uh, interest on the national debt to the government. He wasn't running the Fed like it was a government organization. He was running the Fed like it was going to live forever. And this is where Bob's demonstrated performance really shows how, you know, the, in this anti-Rothbardian statist ideal, Paul Volcker was exactly the guy that Bob was talking about, right? He's the guy trying to keep it alive. He's looking out for the health and welfare of the state by managing it as well as he can and being promoted to these kind of positions where he gets to do that. Right, and, and really, I mean, if, if you look at, and Volcker's a fantastic uh, figure, too. Uh, and he's kind of a mind-blowing one, uh, as a Democrat, no less. Uh, but, yeah, he, he pretty much ran the uh, Fed during Reagan. I mean, the, the, I think it was uh, Greenspan or someone uh, followed him. Yeah. Uh, he, Volcker got out in 87. So oh, was majority, it the whole time? Yeah. Oh, okay. I that was whole that. Reagan revolution... Uh, you know, politically was maybe Reagan and his cohorts, but the economic boom of the 90s, that was mostly Volcker's work. And the uh, the huge stock market crash, Black Monday, I think it was called, uh, that happened in the mid-80s or something like that. Uh, you know, 86 or 89. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, if Reagan, Reagan just kind of was like, oh, I'm letting the Fed handle it. And Volcker did nothing. And yep. the economy re- rebounded in like 18 yep. months, just yep. like it would normally. No big deal. Yep. And but uh, now, yeah. but now I'm going to go to the example that completely destroys Murphy's premise, and that is our good friend Uncle Ben Bernanke. <laughs> right. So here's this guy who, according to everything by demonstrated preference, this guy was promoted all the way to Fed chairman, and here he is completely doing what Walter Block would say is the opposite of a libertarian ideal, not not um, not managing these Fed, like, I, I mean, truth be told, Volcker actually did what a libertarian would do with his bank. He, he let those things go. He didn't try and mess with an interest rate. He didn't try to print money to get out of it. He didn't do any of the, the typical Fed things that we understand. Uh, you know, granted, we're talking about 30 years ago, so in Fed history, I might as well be talking about the Paleozoic Fed. But, but Bernanke is completely the opposite of this guy and he's completely the opposite of what bob murphy uh describes he goes in there already outside the rothbardian ethic he goes in there he prints money he adjusts interest rates he does absolutely everything that he could do to give the federal establishment every advantage that the fed could be milked for yeah every single one of them i don't think i don't think uncle ben spared the horses on any of them so he's completely the opposite of what Walter Block would say is the guy who gets in there and, and shakes it up. But yeah. he is definitely what Bob is describing as, is the, as ye old demonstrated preference. And, and I'm just going to call Uncle Ben, and, and we can even extend that to Janet Yellen, the accidental libertarian. Because if you want to talk about one person that has absolutely destroyed this system, in a strategic way, far more than anybody else ever could have. It's Uncle Ben. <laughs> he has absolutely made this system untenable. If if there was ever hope for it, when when did Greenspan go? Two thousand six. Yeah, I think so. And and he was kind of like, he was like the the guy in between Volcker and uh, Bernanke. You know, regarded as the wizard because he yeah. was actually able to do all the things because of some luck. And yeah. uh, some incredible competence, uh, 
he was able to actually control the economy to a very large extent and not run it into the ground, but able no, to tweak no, on the ages on the edges. No, no. I, I would say that he was a guy who who picked up a, a plane with four engines and he handed it off to Ben Bernanke after losing forty thousand feet of altitude and oh, handed yeah, it over yeah, to yeah. him with one engine. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. But, but yeah. good old Uncle Ben went for a flame out. Oh yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. And now everything is just kind of on this glide path where people expect it to come back in. And yeah. oh well, there's oh there's something we could do to fix it. When in reality, we're the question is how hard of a landing it's going to be. Yeah, and but the, the interesting. But the reason I say both of these arguments are dead is because the man goes in there and behaves completely the opposite of what Walter Block says he should to go to to do this thing, even though he's outside of the Rothbardian ideal, he's the guy strategically who has killed this system that is very anti-liberty, and the whole goal is, I mean, so if you're looking at it from this pure liberty standpoint, you can't even take this job, because it's not within the libertarian ideal, but come to find out, not only is it the job you needed to take, but instead of doing what you would think as far as the demonstrated preference, and you have to have to do these libertarian ideals in place. No, no, no. You have to do exactly what the system asks for. And I think this is the crux of why why you... When I, when I texted you this before, you said it was so many bad arguments that they were making. And I think, I, I think I figured out why. I was alone in the car and I had a couple of hours when I was doing it. So there was really nothing to distract me. And the thing is, Bob and Walter are these extremely learned, intelligent individuals and they take their they take a, an idea and they start from first principles and they work through it in a logical, rational format and they keep things logically consistent and they're really looking for a sound outcome. But the fundamental inherent problem that they didn't look for was the natural inherent irrationally or irrationality of the state itself and some of the things that it's prefers. Yeah. So so you get into these situations with the state and it inherently looks for these preferences that no sane person would do because it's an inherent irrational part of the system. So I think both of these gigantic brains completely discounted the fact that a demonstrated preference would perform the exact opposite because of its irrational nature. Sure. And, and you know, I think this comes back to the metaphor, you know, with the, that I used regarding the Band-Aid. Uh, Volker was the guy who's going to peel it off nice and slow. So he inflicted very little pain on the, on the, uh, on the body politic. Whereas Bernanke, without even intending to, because as you stated, everything is totally irrational when you're, uh, you know, basically the servant of power. He ripped it off. In like no time at all, <laughs> and he just mm-hmm. ripped that bandaid right off. Inflation, gotcha. You know, zero mm-hmm. interest rate. You know, uh, you want the pain? Print that bunny. <laughs> and, and I would change your metaphor up a little bit, as in not a bandaid. He removed a tourniquet. Well, you know, he removed a lot of the skin with the bandaid. <laughs> oh, I'm saying, I'm saying, he opened and, yeah. up the tourniquet, and now nobody can reapply the tourniquet, and the goddamn thing's going to bleed out. Almost and, unavoidably and, so, yeah. And by all of these arguments, you would think, okay, he's outside of the Rothbardian ideal, so there's no way you can take this job to begin with. And then, if you're going to do it, the least you could do is get there and perform as many, you know, libertarian functions as possible by let by trying to manage this system. When in reality, you have to go completely the opposite to slay the, the thing that you're trying to get rid of. And, and I think that's where pretty much their arguments went right out, like just completely, that there's no way that they could rationalize either, either side of that. Because if you did it the one way, it wouldn't work. And if you did it the other way, you didn't work. You had to take both of their arguments, mix them together, and then do the opposite. Right, and you know, it just it does come. It just comes back to the fact that you know, once you're outside that realm of ethics, you're not going to get a positive outcome. You're just right, not, it's you're going to have a win lose, and right. you it's know, a, the lose is going to affect everybody. It's the law of reciprocity. When in, in an inherent mo- when you create a moral hazard, not the, not the case. Yeah, moral moral hazard as an integral function. In something, expecting a positive outcome, yeah, I, I'm, is absolute <laughs> lunacy. Yep. And then the last, the last argument that Block made 
Um, he made it on another show, but he repeated it. And uh, if you are, uh, if you're uh, a Nazi, uh, you you're working in, in a uh, in a camp in a Nazi death camp, and instead of uh, you can you know you're supposed to kill a hundred people a day, but you only kill ninety a day, and you know that if you don't kill if you if you only kill eighty nine, you're going to get caught. So you kill ninety a day, and then at the end of the week you've killed six hundred thirty people, and then they come in and they catch you. And you say, no, 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 I really did take this job because I, I saved 70 people this week by only killing 630. And I, I think Walter's argument, you know, he, he has a book called Defending the Indefendable. And uh, I, I don't think that this is going to function at all. Um, I, think you, I think you are obligated at that point to say, I, we're just going to suffer the one death and that will be mine. And I'm not going to do this job, period, end of talk. Because to to violate, uh, I mean, he does he does admit, yes, you have you you know as restitution to the families. I'm sure one of them is going to want to have you put to death for it. That's fine, but I think just the premise is in, entirely too absurd to uh, to even really rationalize to say I have to kill these people when in reality you don't have to do that. You know, granted, the ramifications might be exactly the same, and you might die beforehand. Exactly, but. But in reality, are you really going to try and justify only killing 90 people a day instead of 100? And I just don't think there's any logic that ever, that can ever be walked out in that one. No, yeah, no, that's, and this is, you know, that, that puts you squarely into consequentialism. And this is, and this is just going to wreck you as a person. So, I mean, regardless, uh, you can either die or you can take a moral stance. And, you know, so in either, in either case, Lots of those people are going to die, and so it's always going to be lose lose. R- right. So and, and yeah, it's, I'm it's just saying just that's. Nothing, nothing I positive. don't even think. I don't even think you can apply consequentialism to that because that's just an acid trip. I mean, trying to justify that in any way, shape, or form is very much an acid trip. So, and, and not to say that the you know the uh, the idea shouldn't ever come to somebody's mind, and then you shouldn't try to kind of walk your way through it. But at the end of the day, if your choice is to kill 90 people or and to say you could have killed 100 or to just bite, take one for the team, uh, I think you got to take one for the team on that one. I, I don't see how that can rationally be walked out anyway. Yeah, I mean, in either case, you, you know, unless you're unless you uh, martyr yourself, uh, there's you're, you're going to be participating in evil. The consequential I, I argument is simply going to be I, I tried my best to minimize it. And yeah. either way, you're still participating in evil. Yes, three men came to offer me this job where I, where at best I kill ninety people a day. I decided to kill one of them and die with him. <laughs> you're and, right. And and, and then somehow yeah. you've managed to do way better than this whole scenario where you've killed ninety instead of a hundred. You only killed one, but he was the right one. <laughs> you killed the murderer on your way out. I still think you're doing way better. Right, and you know, I mean this. It's back to the, uh, you know, hey, uh, what are the, the degrees of, uh, of uh, moral vice, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, theft versus murder, again, weak analogy. These are not the same thing. One right. is demonstrably much worse than the other, you know? So, uh, yeah. So, anyway, uh, that was kind of... This is kind of our fun week where Lloyd and I were just really having something that we could do for us, and hopefully we could kind of share it with you a little bit. But that's the far end of these nerd arguments that you're getting yourself into. Um, you don't really have to go this far, but just to have that understanding of how does a guy who's in the army end of an anarchist, it's because I can walk these things all the way out here and not feel like I'm in over my head talking with Bob Murphy and and Walter Block on the idea, and even to a certain extent, I think some of their arguments weren't very good. Yeah. So, so don't go thinking that that just because you don't have a PhD doesn't mean that you can't make a sound, sane argument. I, I don't think that for for one minute. Nope. So, and just to uh, for those people who uh, don't necessarily want to go all the way, we are looking for a minarchist, a constitutionalist, a, a, a capital L libertarian uh, for a future show. Uh, if you're interested in talking with us and uh, examining the founding documents and uh, whatnot, please get in contact with us, with us uh, via Facebook or Skype or some other means. 
Yeah, we're, we're very, very not about the echo chamber. We, we really kind of want to bring some other people in to have, I, I think it's, uh, it's kind of disingenuous. Even though Lloyd will very much be able to do, the, he could, he could uh, talk communism and socialism at just as well as they can. But I think it's a little disingenuous because if you're listening to that, you're like, we already know this guy's an anarchist. How do I know that this isn't bullshit? And, and I believe, uh, I, great, I think that's a great argument uh, to the point where we would like to have a progressive or we would like to have a constitutionalist come in here and say, you guys are idiots and this is why. I, I love it. Love yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That'd be a, a, a nice fine steak on my plate. I, I would appreciate that. Because <laughs> I have the well, knives of logic and reason I, to right. uh, carve it up. <laughs> yep, and and it's really not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be a, a, a prick waving dick fight. It's not going to be mm-hmm. yelling or anything like mm-hmm. that. Just saying that uh, I think it's a lot more genuine when somebody says, "This is my perspective. This is my argument," and it, and it comes from somebody who's actually one of those. Because uh, you know, the anarchist arguing the left or the right just doesn't really come across as genuine to me. No, yeah, it doesn't ring true when I try to play devil's advocate for communism. It's and really the problem hard. is the vast majority of people who already listen to this show are like, there's no way I'm talking to all those guys. <laughs> I, I get a lot of that. I've, I've asked about six people on Facebook, and they either get back to me, they don't get back to me at all. They're like, I don't think I could talk on that level with that, about those things. So I, we're really looking for somebody who's who's got the... Uh, the tools and the talent. Do you think you understand labor theory of value? Contact us. Do you really understand, uh, you know, natural rights theory? Contact us. Yes. Yes. Let's let's do this game. Let's do it. Um, beyond that, hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope uh, just listening to the other one, you picked up some of the names and and why you might want to look into their content. I uh, I think. Uh, for a New Liberty is a really good book by Rothbard. You heard Chaos Theory from Murphy. Um, Tom Tom Woods has a, a couple of good books, but he's got a lot of stuff that's, I think it's a little more digestible if you wa- watch his shows. Uh, you can get those on Stitcher and iTunes, and there a bunch of them are on YouTube. And on TomWoods.com, he has them all archived there too. So, so if you got something, let us know. We're interested, and if not, I will... Uh, We will see you next time. And we appreciate any kind of feedback. Please leave your likes, leave your comments, leave your arguments, leave your uh, your crazy rants uh, on on the YouTube and uh, and on on Facebook. Yep. Don't tell me I'm a shithead. Tell me why I'm a shithead. That's important (laughs) because because I mean millions of people at this point have told me I'm a shithead. So, but uh, in articulated, this is why you're a shithead. Will go farther. All right, let's wrap it up here. All right. Thank you. Uh, you can get all our stuff, again, at theseedsofliberty.com or on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next week. <laughs>